Uh, okay, so let's see, we were um, in the last class discussing about uh, uh, electron uh, phonon interactions, uh, but uh, primarily we are talking about uh, uh, phonon dispersions and uh, how uh, they are going to impact uh, electronic transport. And uh, at this stage, we are looking at it as a scattering uh, mechanism that uh, determines electron mobility and uh, determines, you know, uh, uh, lowers electronic conductivity uh, in uh, um, all kinds of crystals, semiconductors, uh, uh, polar semiconductors, non-polar, uh, and uh, metals and uh, other crystals like that. Uh, but uh, kind of the uh, remarkable fact about phonons is they also can uh, uh, assist in, uh, in, you know, uh, instead of uh, reducing the conductivity, they can uh, 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 cause uh, phase transitions and they can cause uh, things like superconductivity as well. So we'll talk about that uh, as, uh, uh, mm, uh, you know, as an extension of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, the uh, scattering picture that we have in mind at this point. Okay. So uh, what we did was uh, we kind of derived a very simple model for phonons uh, in the last class, essentially by looking at a mass spring system, and then we got a frequency for the phonons. Uh, uh, discussed about uh, what are acoustic uh, phonons and what are optical phonons. Acoustic phonons uh, where uh, the a next, you know, the nearest atoms are vibrating in phase, uh, so either longitudinal along the direction of the f wave propagation or transverse. Uh, and the uh, the others, the second mode, if you have uh, two two kinds of atoms uh, in a crystal, or uh, or even actually if, if bo both atoms are the same, but if you have two atoms in the basis of a uh, of a crystal lattice, then uh, uh, you can also have optical modes where the uh, nearest uh, neighbors, uh, so essentially you can think of instead of each atom vibrating in phase, the collection of two in some sense is vibrating in phase. So, uh, so the, but the next nearest uh, atoms are out of phase. So if one is uh, uh, in transverse mode going up, the other is going down, then up and down and so on. So, so that's the optical mode. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you can probably see even pictorially that uh, the optical modes will require more energy because there's a lot more local lattice distortion. So the optical energy phonons have a high, much higher energy. In addition, in a very long wavelength scenario, it doesn't matter whether your wavelength is very long or very short, the energy cost is very high. You know, so so it, it doesn't have what you call as a zero energy mode. You know, optical phonons don't have that. And uh, uh, again, from a very simple mass spring system, uh, if you have two masses, M1 and M2, the atom masses are M1 and M M2. You can also write down a very simple dispersion relation that will capture both the acoustic branch and the optical branch together now. So there's a plus and minus. One of them is the higher energy one is the uh, optical, and the lower energy one is the acoustic mode. So the way we are, uh, so there's uh, of course quite a few details about it, uh, about the phonon modes themselves. Uh, uh, we are uh, at this point primarily interested in how do they impact uh, uh, transport of electrons. So, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll actually uh, move in that direction, uh, and uh, here's uh, how we are going to uh, look at it and also set it up such that we are able to, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, the, the, the phenomena of superconductivity also comes from electron, I mean at least the uh, one kind of superconductivity the, uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, electron phonon microscopically due to phonon electron interactions and, and uh, so we'll uh, look at it in that manner. Uh, here's uh, how uh, uh, we are going to set the problem up. Uh, so uh, I have a dispersion of electrons in, uh, and uh, we're looking at the conduction band uh, for electrons, and this is E versus K, and each K state has a, a certain groove velocity, certain energy, and uh, uh, we can uh, write uh, the, uh, the 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 occupation function uh, of, or, or you know, the the, the uh, energy of that uh, whether that state is uh, occupied or it's not occupied, I can uh, uh, find that out by 
finding what is the occupation function and in terms of these operators we have talked about you know the uh, creation and uh, annihilation operators ck dagger ck is going to tell you uh, what how many uh, fermions are there sitting in there in, in that state right in that orbital if you might right? so uh, uh, so that's something we have discussed earlier, right? And uh, hopefully that's okay, um, comfortable with that. Uh, a, a thermodynamic average of that, or, you know, would be the Fermi Dirac distribution, you know, if it's in equilibrium, right? And this number CK dagger CK is uh, this number itself is either zero or one, because it's a uh, fermion operators, so you can either have something or not. But if you take an average over time, or you know, uh, uh, then then uh, on an average, there are particles entering and leaving this this state, and the, uh, that that sort of average is the Fermi Dirac distribution, and this is your electronic energy of k, the state k, but then you know that there are many other states, so you sum over all k states, and that's your total electron energy uh, dispersion. Curve, right? Right. This is the total energy in the electronic system where I might, may have multiple uh, states of the electrons. And I can write uh, the electronic state in an occupation number picture as well, uh, you know, where uh, I can label the uh, states as, uh, you know, K1, K2, K3, and so on. And each of them is how many electrons are sitting in this state, and K2, and so on. So this is the occupation number picture. In this picture, uh, this is the effectively your wave function of our electrons, but in the occupation space. And each of these numbers is a 0 or a 1. You know, so, right. so that's for electrons. Maybe I should explicitly write it's an electron uh, energy dispersion, or the band structure EK diagram. Uh, in a very similar way, uh, what we also have now is, is a dispersion uh, for, uh, for phonons. This is the phonon dispersion. right? Uh, and uh, uh, the wave vector of the phonons, instead of writing Q, just to distinguish it we'll, uh, as K, we are going to use Q. Just, you know, it's 2 pi by the wavelength of the phonon as well. Uh, and uh, uh, unlike the, so electron dispersion, here's the conduction band, and maybe down here we have a valence band. And let's say the valence band is completely full, and we have an n-type semiconductor, so we are only looking at the conduction band. But if you have interband transitions, you, you must also include the valence band. So you can have electron band one, electron band two, and so on. They're essentially, as far as this picture goes, they're just different orbitals. You know, right? so, right. They will have, these orbitals will have their own, uh, you know, uh, remember the operators here are, are, are tied to the orbitals. Uh, CK will not talk to CK here, or, you know, one of the operators there. They're completely independent. You know, so, yeah. In this picture, okay. Uh, so here, uh, for phonons, I can write uh, the, their energy dispersion. Uh, we already have a simple model for it, and uh, I'm going to simplify it further. Instead of having this, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we found was uh, uh, in the last class also that uh, if you look at this low energy part of it, uh, and you find what is the slope, you can expand out your. Basically, what you get is a sine sine q a by two. And the slope of this is just, just the sound velocity, which is why it's called the acoustic phonon, right? And this is the speed which, which uh, sound wave propagates through this crystal. Typically of the order of uh, 10 to the power 5 centimeters per second, roughly, order of magnitude, uh, right? Uh, of that order, like a kilometer per second or something like that, you know. Sound in air is 330 meters per second. It's much faster in a solid because you have much more dense set of atoms. So this sort of propagates faster. So, uh, uh, now, um, so, uh, so what we are going to do is uh, simplify this picture and assume uh, we'll prove very soon that the transverse, for example, the transverse acoustic waves are not going to scatter uh, electrons, but the, the, uh, the longitudinal ones will. You know, and we're going to find that right now. And so we'll, we'll look at an acoustic mode, which will be, you know, uh, we'll make it uh, an approximation that it's linear and uh, it does curve around as a sine function out here. And the optical mode, we are going to just make an assumption, simplifying assumption that it's uh, uh, you know, a constant. And this is a linear mode. That's, I mean, these are approximations. And uh, I think uh, the reason we make them uh, would be very clear, because uh, at low enough energies, this is a very good approximation. It kind of curves around a little bit. But what we are saying is the acoustic modes 
omega acoustic as a function of q, we are making an approximation that this is acoustic frequency is the sound velocity times q. You know, it's a linear function. So that's your energy dispersion for the acoustic phonon modes. And the optical phonon modes, we are just saying h bar omega optical as a function of q, there is no dispersion. So it's a constant, h o, uh, omega optical, let's say. It's constant. Right? It's an approximation. You can see, obviously, there's some amount of dispersion. Uh, and that can be taken into account if you want to do a more accurate theory. But uh, uh, at least qualitatively, uh, it's not going to give us any new things. So we, we're just going to go with the simplification at this point. Yeah. So these are h bar omega of phonons, uh, phonon dispersion. And just like for electrons, uh, we also have you know, individual f modes allowed for phonons, right? Uh, so, so I can write down, if I look at one particular state q here, I can also write down how much energy is in that mode. How much, uh, or, or you know, just like I wrote the Hamiltonian energy term for electrons, I can also write the term for phonons, right? And how should I write that? No. It's actually exactly in the same way as this, right? So, so you you can uh, write it as h bar omega of the phonon mode at any q, uh, and then uh, whether that phonon state is occupied or not. I think we kind of know now that uh, the phonon uh, dispersion, uh, uh, phonon par as, as particles are bosonic, you know, they, they, they behave Bose-Einstein distribution. So instead of fermionic operators, we are going to use B. Uh, and uh, so we write it as BQ dagger BQ. You know, these are, uh, and then you sum over all Qs, and uh, that's your phonon energies now. Now to be actually a little more accurate, uh, and we'll talk about this uh, also today, uh, uh, remember uh, in the last class also when we were talking about Boltzmann transport equation, uh, you could see that already there's an idea of spontaneous and stimulated emission. And uh, we, we should actually take care of this. And this is kind of the zero point energy of a harmonic oscillator picture. You know? So we kind of, I'm going to just write it a little more accurately and there should be a half here. Uh, for most of the cases we are going to deal with, uh, with uh, electron transport, the number of phonons we are going to deal with are typically such that the half won't matter much. You know? But if you are in a regime where you're looking at one phonon situation, then that, that is important. So just like electromagnetic waves, if you are dealing with sunlight that has uh, you know, billions of photons in any mode, so that half doesn't show up. But if you're looking at a single photon phenomena, then it does show up. You know? so, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, so th that's the energy of the photons, uh, sorry, of phonons. And just like we wrote a state for electrons, you know, phi electron, the you know, state of electrons, we can also write down uh, a, f a, a wave function, if you might, or a quantum uh, occupation number state of phonons. And, and uh, j you know, just like we wrote for electrons, I can write you know, phonon in orbital or state one, state two, state three. I can write a uh, you know, occupation number picture for phonons as well. Right? So, so this, and uh, does that make sense? I'm just writing it formally at this point. And the total uh, uh, state of the whole system collectively, uh, uh, actually I should have probably drawn this a little more accurately. Let me uh, sketch it a little more accurately here. The conduction band states of electrons, uh, let's just go from zero here. And the phonon dispersion, these energies, the optical phonon, the max energy, uh, you know, uh, depends on the crystal, but uh, for example, if you look at silicon, we are looking at maybe about 70 milli electron volts, M milli electron volts. And you know, electron energies can be up at one EV or something like that. So this is actually a small thing. So the, the phonons, phonon energies, the maximum energies kind of are close to the bottom of a conduction band, for example. It's not very, uh, uh, electron energies can be electron volts, but uh, phonon energy, the max optical phonon energy is, you know, is about 70, 100. In some, you know, diamond, it would be maybe closer to 200. That's about the highest you can be. Okay. Yeah. Gallium arsenide, silicon. Uh, gallium arsenide is about 36 or 40 MeV. 
silicon is about 70 MeV. So that's kind of just to remember the order of magnitude and you know where where we are in that. Okay. And, and collectively, the modes, uh, uh, the, the state of the system where I have a certain number of electrons and certain number of phonons, uh, you can write the combined state uh, of the system uh, as, as uh, again, you know, um, maybe we should uh, cho choose slightly different numbers, maybe m for phonons, just to, you know, um, m can be mass later, so we should uh, uh, write, uh, yeah in phonon 1, in phonon 2, and so on, okay? So you can write it as, uh, you know, n electron 1, or orbital 1, and 2, and so on. And it's basically just a combined state like this. Does that make sense? Uh, so it's electron, electronic occupation number uh, state and phonon occupation number state. You just cascade them. That's the total state of the system now. It's kind of you think saying the product of the two wave functions in, in, in that sense, right? the, the, the the net state of the system. And and now uh, uh, the idea is when we, when we allow for scattering, then uh, the total uh, Hamiltonian term now becomes uh, uh, h of electrons plus h of phonons, right? uh, energy term plus another term which will be because of uh, interaction where electrons uh, so uh, they exchange energy with the phonons now right, right. Uh, the, so obviously this can come to equilibrium with itself and it causes a fermi dirac distribution within this comes to equilibrium because of bose einstein distribution but uh, you know that the temperature of the fermi dirac is the electrons are in equilibrium with the lattice vibration so it is exchanging energy you know spontaneously emitting, the stimulated emission, absorption, all those processes are occurring. And if these two are in equilibrium, there must be some exchange between the two, right? right? Uh, electron uh, and phonon. And that term is what uh, we are going to now uh, look at. And that is our scattering term. And this is you know, uh, how are electrons exchanging momentum and energy with phonons by emitting, by uh, absorbing, and uh, uh, by uh, um, so those processes are occurring now, and we have to take it, take into account that those things. Yep. Is the deformation potential captured in that term, or is that another term? Uh, this captures every possible phonon scattering mode, and we're going to talk about the deformation potential based scattering and uh, optical phonons, uh, polar optical phonon, each one of them. They are all the exact mode of 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 uh, how the electron interacts with the phonon. Uh, has you know uh, we we can break them up into two or three different categories uh, based on the nature of the crystal uh, and uh, whether uh, so deformation potential polar optical those are uh, those things don't enter here they enter into the electron phonon picture so, yeah <coughs> okay so uh, uh, if if that picture is clear we can start looking at uh, a few. Uh, 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 what we'll do is we'll start looking at a few particular scattering mechanisms like a different potential. But before that, let me set up this picture in a little more general way. Uh, so um, the idea would be, at this point of time, the idea is this is our solved Hamiltonian. Remember, we want to find a scattering rate. This is what we are calling as our solved Hamiltonian. This is our uh, unperturbed system. And this is our you know, perturbing potential, WR. And so in the golden rule, we'll go this term. And the initial state of an electron uh, phonon, the initial state of the system will be, uh, let's say, for example, this state is occupied. And, uh, uh, but then uh, this, uh, a scattering event because of this term. Uh, so this state is occupied. And you, know, you have a certain phonon occupations that are uh, uh, you know, um, bef before the scattering event. But then this electron maybe you know relaxes to this state here, and by emitting a phonon, and that phonon mode appears maybe in an optical mode here. You know you fill that state, increase the number of phonons by one you know, here, right? So so that's a picture we want to have that. Uh, um, so the initial state of the system is the you know this state is let's say empty. This state is occupied, and here I have maybe n q number of phonons. And here, of course, I have CK dagger CK. And then after the final state of the system is this, this goes to 0, whereas you know, 
c k prime c k goes to one, it increases by one here, right? And it goes to zero there. Similar this similarly this phonon mode goes to n q plus one. This is an example of the initial state. For example, will be uh, let's say we look at the kth and the k prime state. Uh, so kth state is one, k prime is zero, and so on, right? That's the initial state and n phonon. And let's say this is the q, which is we are filling here. The k minus, you know, k prime minus k is the wave vector q here. So maybe I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is ten phonons, eight phonons, whatever it is, you know. And then this state here that we are interested in which the electron can emit into, maybe there are two. And, and, and so, right? That's your, the total occupation number picture of the initial state of the system. Uh, so you can write this as psi initial. Right? And psi final will be, as a result, uh, I think you can see this will decrease to zero, and this will increase to one. Right. So you had a transition, electronic transition. But that's always accompanied here in the electron phonon process by a Phonon number, you know, if 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 it emitted into the phonon, uh, then this increased by one. Does that make sense? I mean, this is a picture you can have in mind. And then your matrix element now is uh, uh, this whatever term is here, initial state, and then your final state. This is your matrix element for the Fermi Golden Rule. For example. So does that make sense? I mean, so that Uh, let's also develop one more uh, a little you know uh, pictorial tool but actually it will be very useful uh, i think you uh, may have uh, uh, seen some aspects uh, some things like this um, uh, uh, and you know the real kind of the harder hard work would be to find what exactly is this matrix element and we're going to do that in in a, in a couple of uh, uh, you know, after just drawing one more picture here so uh, another way to draw this, which uh, I think is, is kind of uh, uh, keeps you keeps uh, helps in keeping track of a few things here, is uh, you know this is all happening in momentum space, in the momentum space, Q space, you know, K space, and all that. We can also draw uh, something in the real space, you know, and, and that that's uh, extremely useful too. And uh, uh, this sort of picture. Uh, there are many ways to do it. Th this is one way. Uh, so you can have uh, in real space. Remember, uh, we can think of it as space and time, right? Uh, for this for this process to occur, and uh, uh, we can say that the electron. You can almost think of it as a classical picture now. That the electron is moving uh, in time, and increase. You know, its, it's space coordinate is increasing, right? And uh, uh, if you want to qualitatively think of it this way, the slope dx by dt is the velocity of the electron. You can think of it that way too, the slope of this line. And, uh, and at, you know, at a certain point of time, uh, it, it, is, uh, uh, it collides with the lattice. And uh, uh, it emits a phonon. And the phonon uh, uh, wave, uh, maybe it emits an acoustic phonon. And it's uh, moving with a sound velocity. Now the acoustic wave. So you know, and, and the, uh, if you have a particle like an electron, we know electrons are waves too. Uh, but uh, the phonon we can represent by a little wiggly line, right? And that that has a maybe a little less slope because it's moving slower than the electron. Electrons are moving at 10 to the power seven centimeters per second. Phonons maybe 10 to the power five centimeters per second. That's slower, right? Uh, and and the, just showing the phonon line here. And then the electron uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, you know got scattered, and uh, it's moving. Uh, just uh, as an example, maybe it's moving backwards now. You know, maybe the velocity kind of went backwards. This is a picture of this process. You know. So initial momentum, uh, final momentum. Uh, I'm going to skip the vectors here. Uh, uh, hopefully, it's uh, and then this is uh, uh, you know momentum of the phonon, such that you know. Kf minus k initial uh, is equal to you know the wave vector of the phonon, right? Momentum is conserved in this process, and energy would also be conserved in this process. And that would be the idea. And uh, I think you, I mean, 
uh, some amount of generalization of this would, you know, this is what one would call as this Feynman diagrams or, you know, uh, space time diagrams of uh, fundamental processes. Uh, and what we are trying to find, uh, what a ma matrix element is, is what is the amplitude of this happening, you know? What is the amplitude of this process to occur, right? And mod square of that would be the kind of the probability, if you might, you know? So, so, uh, and then this, uh, you can associate with each of such node in this space-time picture uh, an amplitude for occur, you know, uh, for this process to occur, and that's, that's, that's what this is, you know? so, yeah. Uh, now, uh, so this is uh, this picture is uh, what you would call as a spontaneous emission process, right? Do you see that? I mean, there is no reason for the electron to emit, but you know. Uh, uh, so that that's uh, uh, that. Uh, you can now see that uh, there are many other possibilities here, right? Let's try to draw a picture for uh, absorption, right? Right. So phonon absorption. Uh, so this will have a certain rate of occurrence, you know, and say uh, sp spontaneous emission as a function of, uh, say, electron momentum and all that. So we can calculate that from golden rule, and we'll do that. Absorption process in a, in a similar, you know, space-time picture. Uh, how will that look? Uh, right. Uh, so here again, I mean, maybe your electron is coming along like that. Uh, and uh, how will the phonon look in an absorption process? Where will that be? So, so you know, if the if the event occurs here, in space and time, let's say, right? So the phonon must exist. Phonon cannot be here. Phonon must be in the past, right? Backwards in time. So phonon must exist here so that it's absorbed, right? So so the phonon must come in, maybe you know something like that. Right, and then uh, the electron absorbs that phonon, and maybe it moves, maybe faster, slower, depends, you know, upon the momentum. All, uh, everything must be conserved as well, right? It's just, you know, again, uh, showing, uh, uh, showing another process. So, so that's uh, absorption, and in absorption, there is no such thing as spontaneous or stimulated. You know, it, it just, you know, there's absorption. Right? Uh, but you can also have a stimulated emission, right? You can also have a stimulated emission. How would that be sketched? In this picture, at least. How would that be sketched? Stimulated emission would be, yeah, maybe. Uh, right, right. So exactly right. So uh, stimulated emission is when there's also a phonon in the past. You know, and, uh, and, and that, that causes, I mean, I don't want to mess it up, but now there are two here. So the, it came in with one phonon, and there are two. Or it came in with 30, and now there are 31. You know. So that, that's, that's uh, the way of stimulated emission. So, and you can start thinking of many combinations of this now. Right? Think of many combinations of this. And uh, uh, one of the very important uh, combinations that uh, uh, we will look at in um, maybe in the next class, or if not, uh, on Monday, maybe, uh, is, is when uh, the electron uh, goes in and uh, uh, you know, and then then maybe emits an optical uh, emits a phonon, uh, uh, but then uh, uh, so so uh, another electron basically absorbs that and you know gets out. So this is a virtual interaction where a phonon emitted by one electron is picked up by the other. And uh, and we'll see that this is this is the picture of a Cooper pair, for example. You know, and, and and this is a combined object now. And what we'll see is when that happens, you are able to essentially diagonalize the entire Hamiltonian, where you don't have to deal with that as a perturbation anymore. But the whole Hamiltonian can be diagonalized, and you get a new ground state of the system, and that's the superconductivity. We'll talk about that later, but. Maybe the pictorial thing helps a little bit you know, about about how how to look at it. And there'll be two two matrix elements: uh, one due to emission of phonons, the other due to absorption. And we'll see that because when we combine them, the net energy of this term will be negative, which means that the system can lower its energy if it forms this sort of a you know stable state like this. It can lower its energy because the product of these amplitudes uh, or these probabilities becomes negative and so that means the energy lowering of the system so we we'll see that yeah say it again does it need to absorb the code? 
phone on for the Cooper player, or can it stimulate it a bit too? <laughs> Oh, in, in superconductivity, uh, I, I, uh, that would not be a stimulated version. It would be uh, direct, you know, emission and absorption process between two electrons, and uh, we'll look into that in quite some detail later. Yeah, quantitatively. Okay, so uh, let's actually look at uh, a few of these processes, uh, maybe the emission, and and uh, uh, find out. Uh, what is the amplitude because that's where the quantitative details lie uh, and then that's where we get scattering rates and, and that sort of thing here. Any other questions at this point? I mean we have, I've really not done any new work just setting up some, you know, um, uh, jargon and that sort of thing at this point. Okay, so, okay, uh, uh, so let's look at uh, now the microscopic details of the phonon uh, and how, uh, how is it propagating in a crystal. Maybe I'll just use this picture initially. Uh, so we have already found that uh, if, if, a dis if an atom of, uh, is displaced by an amount u, you know, in length, uh, typically it would be, you know, kind of sub angstrom, 0.1 angstrom, or much lower. There. The vibrations are very small compared to the lattice constant. Lattice constants are about, uh, you know, few angstroms, and the vibrations are a very small fraction of that. You know, so. But uh, uh, as it uh, vibrates, uh, uh, the uh, we say that the displacement of each atom is u. And uh, we already talked in the last class that the uh, so, uh, that the uh, the vibrations uh, 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 the 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 allowed modes for these uh, vibrations to occur are in uh, uh, form waves, and the uh, you know the uh, u as a function of uh, space and time uh, can be written as an amplitude of that wave times uh, uh, you know, uh, a, st a very st uh, standard qx minus omega t, where q is the wave vector for the phonon, and omega is the frequency. You know. And this is written for ev you know, separately for each of these states. You know, because remember, when you have a wave, uh, for every mode, uh, you know, q, q and omega are tied to each other. Right? So they define an individual mode. You know, and they're all orthogonal to each other. For a light wave, for an uh, electromagnetic wave, they are truly orthogonal. In a crystal wave, uh, we saw that, uh, if, you, if you remember, uh, the origin of that was, you know, because this is a harmonic oscillator, we said we can light it as, a, you know, orthogonal waves. But uh, this is never quite exactly a harmonic oscillator. There's some cubic terms and non-harmonic non, non terms, too. So they cause uh, mixing between them. So they're not true ground states, is what I mean to say. You know. Not true ground states. For light, they are. For opti opt uh, but but uh, because the photon field, uh, uh, the total energy is indeed e square plus you know h square. Uh, again, I mean there's some constants and all. The total energy, or total Hamiltonian, goes as square of electric field square of. So it's really a square. There are no cubic terms in a electromagnetic field. But here, this is uh, uh, you know over large time scales. This is not truly a ground state. Is what I mean to say. And that, you know, the fact that it's not really a ground state also leads to the fact that you can have thermal conductivity. You know. If you don't have, if there are true ground states, you cannot dissipate in the crystal you know, and, and such things. Uh, um, okay, so here's the displacement, and these are these two are tied to each other, the omega and q. Uh, and, uh, and and what we want to now see is how 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 are the electrons interacting uh, with this with this uh, lattice vibration that's moving forward. Uh, you can see that the displacement should always be a vector, really, right? Uh, because it, it depends on which direction are the atoms vibrating, transverse, longitudinal, you know, which direction. And so I can write here, uh, you know, uh, uh, Q dot R to capture that fact that uh, uh, the wave vector is also, in the direction in which the wave is going is also a vector, right? 2 pi by wavelength. And uh, we can, uh, what? Uh, notation is this uh, using a okay, and we can also associate a unit vector along which you know this vibration is occurring. Just the unit vector in which uh, direction in which it's going. You know, so okay, so uh, at this point of time, we don't know what is the uh, amplitude of this vibration, but uh, I think you can probably guess that uh, because it's phonons, it will be related to the temperature of the crystal. It will be related to the temperature of the crystal, and we will uh, derive uh, this from 
making an analogy between classical and quantum mechanics, what exactly is that? You know? And then what we'll see is, uh, uh, we'll see later, is uh, that u naught will be a uh, square root of uh, h bar, which Planck's constant, twice mass density, volume of a unit cell of the crystal times the frequency or omega of that mode. And we'll see that later. So, so, and this, is, we'll, this will come out, the amplitude of, oh, sorry, times the Bose-Einstein distribution uh, square root. We'll see that later. This is the Bose-Einstein distribution or number of phonons. Uh, we'll see that later. Okay, so, uh, and that's the temperature dependence comes with the number of phonons. In other words, more is the number of phonons, more is the amplitude of vibration. And, and that, that's the meaning. Of it, yeah. uh, now, uh, if, if this is the lattice displacement, uh, then uh, uh, we have also uh, real, uh, discussed earlier that if I have, um, you know, the uh, locally, uh, if I have the lattice, you know, getting uh, squeezed uh, or it's getting, you know, stretched out, squeezed, stretched out, and all that. Uh, so if, if that happens, uh, we also know that uh, the band gap of a semiconductor, you know, electronic gap of a semiconductor, this thing here, depends on the lattice constant. Now, smaller is the lattice constant, larger is the band gap. Larger is the lattice constant, smaller is the band gap. So if you look at the minimum or the potential energy that the electrons see, you know, so the band gap is decreasing in regions where the atoms have come closer to each other that are squeezed. And it's increasing in regions where, in, in regions in real space, where the atoms are farther apart or stretched out. You see that? I mean, this is a, it's a uh, so, so even the minimum of the conduction band is, you know, do, uh, looking, uh, it looks like a, uh, you know, wave itself. And here's the conduction band minimum. And here's the valence band maximum. Okay. So the electron now, instead of seeing a uh, uniform potential, is seeing these variations in, 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 the, in the band edge. And this is, this is your scattering potential, really. This is your W. Uh, you know, the, 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 the variation from a flat band condition is your W of R comma T, you know, scattering potential, right? Uh, uh, and, 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 uh, so you can also see that uh, if I, uh, on the other hand, if I, instead of taking, you know, uh, the displacement, uh, if the displacement was equal everywhere, then you can't get this, you know, because that means I've taken the crystal and moved it, you know, rigidly from here to there. So there's no squeezing or stretching of the atoms, so there's no change in the band gap. Right? So that means that uh, instead of uh, uh, you, the, the, the W of, or the scattering potential, or the perturbation, in this picture should not be proportional to u, but to the gradients of u, you know, to the change in u. Does that make sense? If the displacements of this atom and the next lattice point and the next lattice points are changing, only then you can get this sort of squeezing and stretching, right? So, yes. I think if you do in mechanics, this should be also uh, really clear. But, uh, and uh, uh, how much is it stretching? Uh, this quantity, uh, uh, okay, let's just take the gradient of uh, this function first and see uh, what it tells us. So we're saying that the uh, pertur perturbing potential uh, must be proportional to, I'll write it equal now for now, and then we'll say, so it to the uh, gradient or in three dimensions, uh, that is the divergence of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of that vector field. So this is a vector field. Uh, and uh, so divergence of this in real space will you know, take d by dr if you want, and it will pull out a iq to the front. You know. Everything else is constant here. Uh, so what you will get is when you take a divergence of this function, uh, what I get is uh, i times q uh, is pulled out, and then you get u naught, same thing again, q dot r minus omega t, right? And uh, everything else that was sitting in the front stays, so I still have that a, and now you've got a dot product between the direction of vibration of the atoms and the direction of propagation of the wave. And there's a dot product between the two now. Right? And uh, from here you can see right away that, uh, so, and, and, and uh, this is an energy, and uh, here what you have is Q, and look at, look at the dimensions, Q is one over length, this is a length, uh, so there must be, so this is dimensionless. Right? 
and there must be an uh, energy term here. And so the, uh, the initial idea for uh, what is that energy was introduced by uh, Bardeen uh, and Shockley, John Bardeen and William Shockley. And it's kind of the simplest idea. They're saying, let's assume that the displacement or the change in the gap or the change in uh, you know, uh, this energy minima of the conduction band is proportional to the strain. So it's a linear approximation. Just say that it's proportional. And the proportionality constant is what is called the deformation potential. You know, that's what I was talking earlier. What is the unit here? Well, uh, any notation you use, uh, I think it says some sort of a EA. OK, so that's a, sometimes you know, it's used as deformation potential acoustic and all that sort of thing, the different unit, uh, terms used for it. You can ballpark how much should be the magnitude of this. Uh, because uh, typical semiconductors have band gaps of few, you know, maybe an electro electron volt order of magnitude, and uh, um, uh, the lattice constant uh, um, is is uh, of the order of a few angstroms, right? And so, if you uh, you know l look at this this quantity, uh, this should be of the order of a few eV. You know, what does that mean? That if I have a strain of a few percent, 0.1 percent, or something like that then the band edge changes by maybe few millielectron volts. You know, that's the idea. So this is typically off the order of uh, maybe 10 EV, 8 EV. You can calculate it from DFT and first principles. You know, if you strain it, how much does the gap change? You can calculate it. You can also calculate it from back of the envelope tight binding model too. You just do a simple perturbation. And it's that order of magnitude, you know, of that order of magnitude. Uh, OK. so. Um, I'll just use D instead of this if, you know, deformation potential acoustic modes. You know. uh, now, uh, so from here you can see that at least in this picture, that uh, if the if we are looking at a transverse acoustic mode, you know where the Q vector is, uh, you know the Q is going this way, uh, but the lattice vibrations are perpendicular to it, right? Transverse. In that case, that goes to zero. So this doesn't scatter. Right? This, this particular mode will not scatter. The only modes that will scatter then are acoustic when, uh, sorry, is the longitudinal mode when A and Q are parallel to each other. So uh, A hat is, uh, you know, that situation would be transverse acoustic. And uh, A hat and Q, that would be longitudinal acoustic, right? Right, and then and, and this one will scatter, this one will no, not scatter in this picture. Uh, actually, these things are really tensor properties, and if depending upon some crystal st structure, some, you know, this rule may be violated in some crystals. But for cubic crystals, this is a pretty accurate statement that you're not going to be able to scatter with transverse acoustic modes. And even in crystals where this is violated, the TA scattering is relatively weak for electrons. Yeah? Did I say 10 EV? Yes, 10 electron volts, order of magnitude. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So, so you can kind of ballpark that if your lattice vibration is 0 0.1 angstrom, uh, or rather the strain is, say, you know, 0.1%, so that will lead to about a, I don't know, 1 MeV change in energy. It's not very large, but it's, you know, it, it's enough to scatter electrons. OK, so, so that's your uh, scattering potential now. and. Uh, um, uh, all right. Uh, so uh, if we are looking at just the longitudinal acoustic modes, uh, I can say a dot q, uh, and there's an i here, uh, and a dot q is just q, you know, amplitude, right? Uh, if if it's uh, parallel, a is a unit vector, just q, uh, and q is the wave vector. Uh, does that make sense? I just you know they're they're, uh, they're collinear, so so I, I take that into account, and now uh, I can use this uh, as my uh, W in uh, R T or the and, and then calculate what is the matrix element that I need for uh, you know I can calculate that now. Before I do that, I'll just outline a few other uh, uh, phonon modes because we just write them down and then you combine all of them and the mechanism of scatter, uh, you know calculating this is the same for all really right so. Okay, so uh, uh, the second mode uh, is is the, uh, this this acoustic mode that we are talking about, where the wave goes through. Uh, this may be hap this can happen in crystals that are piezoelectric. 
you know, for silicon is not a piezoelectric crystal. All the atoms are the same. And uh, uh, silicon, uh, though there are two atoms in the unit cell, both atoms have equal electronegativity and equal effective charge. So there's not a piezoelectric situation. Whereas if you have gallium arsenide or gallium nitride, uh, any compound semiconductor will, because the two atoms are different, uh, the um, if you strain it, uh, th they have slightly different effective charges. You know, there's slight charge charge misbalance. One is slightly positively charged, the other is slightly negatively charged. And if you have that situation, in addition to the fact that you have this mechanical, you know, change in the band gaps, you also have a charge, you know, some Coulomb effect also. Does that make sense? I mean, I have positive, negative, positive, negative, and you can see that there's in addition to the mechanical wave, there's also a charge wave going through it here, right? Um, because the atoms have some charge, them, in, in, uh, positive and negative. Uh, you know, uh, so gallium nitride, for example, the effective, uh, it gets more and mo uh, more ionic because electronegativity of nitrogen is very, very large. So it kind of, uh, nitrogen atom is, you know, slightly negatively charged and the gallium atom is slightly positively charged, right? And when you have a wave like this go through, uh, uh, then it will also create, in addition to the mechanical you know, strain and stress, it will also create an electric field and an electric potential. Right? And, and that's actually not hard to calculate. What you do is uh, uh, you say that the electric potential is equal to the you know, uh, integral of electric field. Electric field is the gradient of potential, so V of X. Or, you know, um, and and uh, you can write down your Maxwell equation that the displacement D is equal to epsilon naught times electric field plus the polarization of the crystal. And uh, the polarization here is due to the piezoelectric effect. The piezoelectric effect, uh, uh, again, just like we did for the you know, deformation potential, uh, we say that uh, the amount of polarization, we, the amount of electric field or potential we create is proportional to the strain. So you strain a crystal, it develops a little you know, charge and uh, potential across it. So this is the piezoelectric coefficient of the material. Um, and, uh, uh, and then you kind of, uh, so, so from here, you can find out what is the electric field. It's related to the piezo potential and the, you know, uh, the, the gradient of the strain. And, um, and that's really it. And you, you know, use this to find, you know, integrate the electric field, get the potential. And you get this term here, and uh, so the uh, net, uh, so the net, net potential uh, change for piezoelectric is given by something like this. Good. this. <coughs> for for uh, for uh, deformation potential, acoustic modes is like that. For piezo potential, is like that. This is your scattering term for electrons. The more interesting, uh, or rather, uh, the, uh, one of the other things is, is this is called an optical deformation potential. By the way, uh, so what, what, what I'm trying to say is if you know what is the dielectric constant of the material and what is the piezo coefficient, you can calculate this the whole thing again, I mean, the scattering rate with this. Here's an electron deformation potential uh, uh, optical phonon. Now, this is a, a slightly different kind of uh, uh, deformation potential situation where you have an optical phonon going. And remember, that means that the nearest neighbors are out of phase. So here, it's showing, uh, you know, really a dimerization situation almost. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this this uh, wave uh, is causing an optical phonon is still causing. Uh, uh, this is kind of an important point that the optical phonon propagation, when uh, for that you can see that even when the phonon wave goes through, um, there are local distortions again, right? And here you don't need a gradient. Do you know what I mean? Uh, here, uh, the the amount of perturbation to the uh, electronic system or the is proportional to the local vibration itself. It's not related to the gradient because you know in, uh, next nearest neighbors are already going against each other, right? So so you don't need a gradient, uh, and that's why even at zero, you know, very long wavelength, uh, you still pay a lot of energy to create this mode. Of optical mode, and because of the strain, uh, local strain again, uh, you have uh, for optical deformation potential. You uh, this is you know scattering potential is directly proportional to the you know difference in the displacement of the nearest atoms, meaning within one, and uh, you don't have a derivative at all. Does that make sense? It's not you know uh, you, you don't have to have a del u 
the deformation potential scattering rate is really proportional to uh, you know uh, the optical deformation potential times you know basically uh, within a unit cell it's u1 minus u2 you know, so, so, but it's proportional to effectively the u not the derivative spatial derivative uh, and and that uh, uh, again by units this is units of length now not dimensional not strain so the, as a result uh, this must have units of energy per unit length and uh, again uh, by the fact that you know gaps of a semiconductor in electron volts and the lattice constants are of the order of angstroms this would be of the order of an electron volt over angstrom and typically it's 10 to power 8 ev per centimeter you can do the numbers here so that's how much it is for most semiconductors silicon gallium arsenide and so on this turns out to be not a terribly important scattering mechanism for uh, gallium arsenide and others where the the polar optical phonon dominates uh, but for silicon and all it can actually uh, uh, be useful. Uh, a bigger use of this is the fact that uh, it has a very high energy. So if the electrons are very high energy. They really, you know, prefer to <coughs> emit into these modes you know, because it's, it, it, they can lose a lot of energy in one shot, in one scattering event. So that, that's okay. I'm going through this a little faster now, and, and you're uh, solving your problems, and you're going to read through this hopefully and uh, uh, evaluate these. Uh, um, and, and the last one which I'm going to look at in some detail is the optical phonon or a polar, sorry, polar optical phonon scattering. Mm, I, I don't think, again, I will go through the full derivation of it, uh, but uh, I would like to kind of emphasize that this is a very important scattering mechanism for, uh, you know, the fastest or the, you know, semiconductors that have the very good transport properties, um, like gallium arsenide, indium arsenide gallium nitride this is the dominant scattering mechanism at room temperature so this w this is what limits the performance of some of the uh, you know um, fastest transistors today uh, for electronics uh, um, and uh, also mean you know basically this is also a mechanism which is extremely important for superconductivity so I just will just outline it and then we come back to it later uh, so a polar optical phonon is, is uh, very similar to what we talked about in piezo where, uh, you know, the ne next nearest charge is, you know, a positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on, except now it's an optical phonon. These are, uh, uh, you know, you can see this is an acoustic mode because the vibrations are going, you know, in, in phase. Uh, whereas for the optical mode, so essentially if e next nearest neighbors are positive and negative, you can now imagine that there is a, basically a very strong dipole now uh, you know the positive and negative charges and uh, um, and it's an optical mode so uh, uh, so so essentially uh, the, the way we will write the electrostatics of it we want to find again the electric potential that is seen by the electrons electric potential so to do that we again go back to Maxwell equations and say that displacement vector is equal to epsilon naught times electric field plus the polarization of the crystal. Now this is a, a polar optical phonon uh, and uh, uh, there are actually two, uh, so there are two terms here. One is what's called a DC polarization, the other is AC or high frequency polarization. So when the crystal uh, is uh, you know, um, vibrating as the wave goes through, the DC part of it is, uh, so here's the deal. So the nuclei are much heavier than the electron clouds you know, of an atom. So electron clouds can respond very fast, but the nuclei cannot respond very fast. They're much more sluggish. And as a result, uh, you lose a certain amount of polarization if the frequency of the wave that goes through is very fast because the nuclei are unable to respond that fast. You know. And as a result, the dielectric constant or effective dielectric constant at AC and DC are quite different. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the relative dielectric constant for, uh, say, gallium arsenide or most semiconductors at DC conditions, it's about 10 relative dielectric constant, meaning the electric field inside the material is 10 times lower than it would be in vacuum. Right? The epsilon for any Coulomb interaction, it's scaled by 10 because that's what sits in the denominator of a Coulomb interaction. Right? But if that interaction is happening at you know, 100 terahertz, then, you know, the, atom, the nuclei cannot vibrate that fast. Uh, the nuclei have a very big contribution to the, you know, screening and the dielectric constant, but now they cannot vibrate that fast. And so this goes down to maybe four or three, you know, the epsilon infinity 
is, is much lower. And, and that actually shows up in the Froelich interaction. So essentially you have uh, you know, the uh, uh, large la uh, high frequency epsilon and uh, low frequency epsilon and uh, the net, uh, the picture of, the, uh, of this scattering event is unlike you know, here uh, for the polar optical phonon, the scattering picture is you know, as the wave goes through, I have uh, dipoles formed, uh, positive and negative charges, you know, dipoles formed. It's a longitudinal optical phonon, LO mode. Uh, the wave goes through that way, and the atoms are also vibrating in that way. So I have a positive, negative, perhaps, and then, you know, uh, I have maybe a negative, positive, and, you know, uh, well, no. I'll just sketch the dipole as, you know, a tail. Uh, on arrow, uh, so there's a dipole, charge dipole like that, there's a charge dipole like that, there's a charge dipole like that. In every unit cell, it's flipping now. Right? So, does that make sense? And, uh, and uh, uh, th so that, that means, uh, uh, I think the dipoles go from positive. So I have this, uh, these are, again, remember, these are not uh, electrons, but these are the uh, charges of the nuclei and the electron clouds. And, and, and they're kind of displaced in this way as the wave goes through. And as a result, uh, I have, uh, you can see that I have an electric field that is, you know, uh, uh, I have a, a electric field wave also because the charges are piled up or, you know, uh, positive and negative this way. And as a result, I have a electric potential W that will be periodic here too, right? Uh, and it's a wave because it's propagating with time. And the picture to, uh, the way to look at this is these dipoles, the effective uh, dipole, uh, I think you know this, uh, you know, you, you think of it as electron charge times some distance or, or, or charge times the distance between the positive and the negative charge, right? So that's the dipole moment, right? Uh, here, uh, if, 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 if you really had an electron here and a proton here, then this would be the situation. But remember, we're talking about full atoms and they don't, really lose an electron to the other atom, you know, so they, it's shared. Right? So we have an effective dipole moment where it's, it's, it's not the full electron charge, but a certain fraction of it, E star, and that's what is called that bone effective charge. And the distance here is basically the distance between, effective distance between, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the atoms, physical distance between the atom centers of the nuclei. So this is a, E star is that effective charge. Delta U is the distance between the two charges of a dipole, and omega is the volume of a unit cell. So this is dipole moment per unit volume. This is polarization. The physical meaning of polarization is, you know, uh, macroscopic polarization uh, is given by uh, summation of microscopic dipole moments over, you know, the volume over which you are summing over. Right? So if I have many little dipoles inside a volume that are, let's say, aligned or maybe not aligned, you know, if it's not, not extremely polar, uh, I sum them all and I divide by the volume, that's the total polarization of that solid or the crystal. That's the physical meaning of it, right? It's just like magnetization. So if you have spins, they're aligned, then you, it's magnetic. If you have charge and they're, you know, form electric dipoles, maybe it's a ferroelectric or it's, you know, uh, or it's not ferroelectric, but it's a polar crystal because a wave went through and they aligned the charges like that. So, yeah? In general, uh, the charge uh, is uh, um, so the polarization indeed is a you know is a tensor. You're asking whether the E star should be a tensor. It should in general be one. Yeah, it will depend on the exact direction of. Uh, uh, and if I have more atoms in the crystal, then indeed it, you have to take care of which particular bond are we talking about now. If I have just two atoms, then it's you know one number. So yeah, right. Get, get a little more involved, but uh, I mean the idea is straightforward and the charges here are typically if you calculate the number, you can, here's a formula for calculating what is the effective bone charge. Uh, you know, allophonon frequency, dielectric constant, m mass density and difference of, you know, high frequency and low frequency. You can calculate, excuse me, calculate it. Uh, if your solid was completely ionic like sodium chloride, it would be very close to one where, you know, effectively your charge is the full electron charge. But in a, Semiconductor crystal, this would be much smaller, maybe 0.1 or even smaller than that. You can do the numbers here and see how much it is. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so the electric field, uh, we already saw the deformation potential picture and we saw that uh, you know, the scattering potential is a constant times the displacement of the dipole in the very same way for this optical phonon. Now instead of the uh, you know, mechanical energy, you have this charge based Coulomb energy now, E star, you know, E star over volume and dielectric constant uh, times the displacement of that energy and that's the electric field and uh, potential is an integral of the electric field. So essentially you end up with a nice formula here which has the Born effective charge. And uh, notice this difference of dielectric constants, one over low uh, high frequency dielectric constant minus one over low frequency dielectric constant. This is of the order of three or four in most semiconductors, this is of the order of 10. So you know, one third minus one over 10. So that's what we're getting here. For, for, and this is a characteristic of whenever we see this uh, polar optical phonon interaction, which is, was first formulated by Herb Herbert Froelich. Uh, it's called the Froelich interaction, and it will always appear in this form. Of, of, uh, the, uh, so this is really the strength of the scattering, and then when you put into the golden rule, you know that you get square of the matrix element, so this will get squared, and so the square root will become, you know, it will become proportional to it in the end, the, the Froelich uh, strength of scattering. Okay, so there are some other details I'm skipping over here, but once we have done all this, uh, now we want to, uh, so what did we do? We kind of have created a table with scattering potential for polar optical phonons, uh, for uh, deformation potential optical phono uh, phonons, for uh, piezoelectric acoustic phonons, for you know, uh, longitudinal acoustic deformation potential phonons. You can create you know, every phonon mode. Maybe you have some other modes we haven't discussed about here, but this kind of captures most of the traditional modes. And you see that for every one of them, uh, what you will notice is uh, there is a term sitting which is the amplitude of the vibration. You know, if you look at, for example, well, uh, you know, the U, which is the, uh, you know, uh, it, it has the amplitude, which is the, uh, you know, U naught, which is, this term, where did it go? Yeah, so that term is sitting in front of all of them, and we haven't yet talked about how do you get that. Because once you know, know how to get this, uh, you, you can combine and get the uh, scattering rates now completely. So, and, and that, that really is uh, given by uh, this, uh, you can, you can uh, it's kind of a nice uh, analogy, and I, uh, that if I, look at a mass spring system. Uh, this can be done much more rigorously, but the answer is the same in the end, and this is, I think, intuitively m more appealing. If I have a mass spring system, uh, I can write my amplitude of vibration, and this is done in 1D, it carries over you know, exactly the same way to three dimensions. Uh, so, uh, so the displacement is uh, given, you know, if, if, it's a, if, if uh, 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 we take the real displacement, then uh, I can write it, as u naught times the wave part plus its complex conjugate. And uh, if I square it, you get four u naught square cosine. Sorry, this is cosine square. I think it's still not changed. Cosine square, right? Uh, omega t. So that's your displacement, how it's changing in space and time, right? And it's proportional to square of the. Uh, uh, so the kinetic energy of a mass spring system is half mv squared, and velocity is basically displacement uh, over time, du by dt. And so that kinetic energy is half m, uh, sorry, you do that and you get u naught square sine squared term. Yeah. Potential energy of a mass spring system is half spring constant times displacement squared, right? half kx squared. So you get same thing, but cosine squared now, sine squared and a cosine squared. And you also know that in a mass spring system, omega and k and m are related like that. Right? So you put that in. And you get total energy is kinetic plus potential, and you know uh, omega and k are related. So you just get rid of the k or the spring constant, and you write it like that. So this is the total energy of a mass spring system, and uh, mass is m, frequency at which it's oscillating is omega, and the amplitude of vibration is u naught. Right? So u naught squared. Now that must be equal to uh, if we are looking at a particular mode of the vibration. Let's say I'm looking at this particular mode of the vibration. You know. Then how much energy, so that's uh, classical mechanics telling me is that's the total energy. You know, that, uh, and that's how it's related to the amplitude of vibration. It's just you know, 2m omega squared u naught squared. 
But uh, from, from a picture of uh, you know, this thermodynamics and quantum here, we know that this is a phonon mode and the amount of energy in that mode is, is, is basically uh, you know, the h bar omega of that particular mode, that's the energy of that mode, times the number of phonons that you have in that mode. Right? That's the total energy of that mode. And uh, if I write it like that, does that make sense? The total energy of that omega mode is just Bose-Einstein function times the energy of that mode. And so from here, you get that u naught square is really how, it's, how is it related to all the material parameters. Uh, the other thing is mass is mass density rho times the volume. And if you're looking at a unit cell, then uh, you can see that the ma mass density of the solid and this, th this can be the mass of the unit cell, for example. And this is the mass of, say, if you have two atoms in a unit uh, primitive cell, then it's the ma sum of the masses of two atoms. Or gallium and arsenic or sil two silicon. So but that's the mass density. This is the unit cell volume. And uh, with that, you have a full-blown expression for the amplitude of vibration now. And that's, uh, yeah, I mean, so this is completely quantum mechanical now. Uh, you can see it has Bose-Einstein distribution and it has this, this amplitude function here. Uh, and I think that's what I was writing earlier. This h bar over two times mass density times unit cell volume frequency and then square root of and, and, and phonon. Does that make sense? I mean that, so you, if you heat it, if you at a higher temperature, you can calculate what, how much will the, you know, how many angstrom will this be or how many picometers will this be? You can calculate it directly from here. Uh, uh, and and uh, okay. Any questions? All right, if not, uh, I'll, I'll then uh, move forward and just finish this part, uh, I think, uh, of calculating it. Uh, uh, so let's just choose one of the scattering mechanisms. It's actually pretty much the same for all other scattering mechanisms. Uh, let's look at uh, maybe the piezo, or not the piezo, maybe the defor deformation potential scattering mechanism. Uh, and uh, we take this whole thing we already calculated. It's written in, so I think uh, in this slides I have beta, but Q and beta are the same thing. It's just the wave vector, you know, whenever you see beta dot r is q dot r, it's the same, physically the same thing really. Uh, and uh, I take this now and uh, I want to find from golden rule my scattering rate. Uh, and uh, uh, to do that, uh, I think you can uh, think of how one would, you know, the matrix element is i times the deformation potential. I think we wrote it somewhere, yeah. This is your uh, scattering term. And uh, to find it, you know, between initial state and uh, final state, and then uh, put this in there, so you get I times deformation potential and all this other stuff. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what I'll do is uh, I will not include this part in the matrix element, and maybe you can tell me why, because this is a time-dependent scattering potential. Right? This is a time-dependent scattering potential, so if I were to go back and look at how have I plan to take into account time dependent scattering potentials uh, the golden rule in the golden rule itself so I'll say scattering rate from k to k prime will be 2 pi over h bar right times the matrix element squared but this matrix element is just the spatial part not the time dependent part okay? and the time dependent part comes here e uh, k minus uh, e k prime minus e k plus minus h bar omega right that's your absorption and emission process, energy, uh, uh, right? So if your scattering potential is of the form e to the power i omega t plus maybe e to the power minus i omega t, I'm just breaking it up in this way, okay? Then this part goes here, these parts go here, right? That's how it breaks up, that's how we had set up our whole golden rule idea. And so I will only take the spatial part of this scattering potential uh, with the understanding that the omega will cause absorption and emission and we can handle it here separately. So, uh, and the spatial part of it is actually pretty simple, right? Uh, we see I times deformation potential times Q, uh, what else is there? Times U naught, which is the amplitude of the vibration, times E to the power I Q dot R, right? So that's your full, uh, W of R without the time part of it. So, and that's what goes here. 
And uh, I think you can now see that uh, the scattering, uh, the, the, the matrix element, as we have done before, is really uh, the uh, Fourier transform between the two. You know, we have done that too uh, earlier, right? So the matrix element is, you know, the term that's there. It's the Fourier transform of e to the power i. You know, to, to write it out completely, you have k final. Or, or so I'm using k prime dot r minus square root of volume. That's the final state. Initial state is e to the power i k dot r over square root of volume. These are the free electron. I mean, the envelope functions, and then the matrix element is d cubed r, right? Initial state, matrix element, and final state. Right? And so that, that uh, clearly is really a, a Fourier transform again of uh, k minus k prime dot r of, of the scattering potential here. Uh, and uh, you will get kind of a couple of things here. First, first of all, you can see that all, all these complex exponentials, uh, whenever you see complex exponentials, you know that it's going to give you some sort of a Kronecker delta or a Dirac delta. And whenever you see such complex exponentials, the first thing that should come to your mind is this is some, telling me of some sort of a conservation law. And here it is momentum conservation in, in this picture. Right? So. Uh, is that obvious? I mean, basically, what it's saying is, if if uh, you can say this is an oscillatory part in space, it's oscillating, right? Whereas this is not really oscillating at all, right? So this is not changing, but because it's oscillating, uh, it has a phase, uh, and uh, if if this uh, um, if k, so you have e to the power i, you know, k minus k prime. And then you have a q here. But you see that, that I only chose one q, uh, you know, e to the power i q. But there's actually, if you want to kind of write it full blown, there's also a e to the power minus i q to have a real, real displacement here, right? just like we saw that. So uh, in general, it will be plus minus q dot r. You know, so that's that. And uh, in general, uh, this is how the oscillatory part is going to look. And if the oscillatory part argument here, if that goes to zero, then you get a matrix element. If not, it will take the whole term to zero because it's oscillating. If some parts are positive, some parts are negative, it will kill it, right? And that is because you can see right, right away what is it physically telling you that h bar k, uh, or you know, k prime is h bar k plus minus uh, the phonon wave vector. So it's a energy, uh, it's a momentum conservation law, right? Right away, you know, so that the final electron momentum is equal to initial electron momentum plus the phonon momentum if it absorbs minus if it emits. Okay. So, so this, this is the uh, simple relationship here. And once you evaluate this whole thing, uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is uh, I can pretty much write it down that it will give me a, here it will give me a chronic delta, okay, not a Dirac delta, but a chronic delta, uh, meaning it's so a K prime and K plus minus q, these two should be the same. And then I will get i times uh, you know, of deformation potential q uh, u naught. I actually, I don't have to do, do the integral you know, so, yeah. uh, and volume and all that sort of thing. It, this is how it's going to look here. Yeah. And uh, now uh, that's what's going to go into this matrix element here, okay? And uh, um, uh, this total scattering rate now has to look something like this. I'm kind of skipping over a few things in the interest of time here, but uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of say before I uh, go, go, go ahead is, is there's also the fact that, uh, you know, you see this kind of uh, in the Dirac delta, what I've done here is I've written down the energy conservation, here's the momentum conservation, we just write that. It comes out of the matrix element itself directly. Uh, energy conservation, the final electron energy is equal to initial electron energy plus minus the phonon energy. And from here, you can write down that the, how are the, these are two equations that should be solved, uh, they, they're, they're, they have to be consistent. Energy and momentum are simultaneously conserved. And that actually places a certain restriction on the angles 
over which you can scatter uh, because you know initial energy is k and final energy is k prime right let's say uh, final momentum is k prime and uh, with phonons your k prime for example uh, if the phonon scattering is due to optical phonons you can absorb an optical phonon and remember you know the kinetic energy for parabolic bands is proportional to the square of the k h square k square right so the final energy can be actually larger final vector could be larger for phonon absorption or it could be smaller for the phonon uh, emission so uh, and that places some restrictions on the angles by which you can scatter you know, so. <coughs> Uh, uh, so and, and and if you write down these two equations, you get you know this relation. Uh, basically, plug that in into that. You are going to and theta is the angle of scattering uh, between the k and the k prime. You get this equation here. And what you know is cosine theta can never be larger than one or less than minus one. So it will restrict the k's and q's that can interact with each other. It restricts that space. Okay. Uh, all right, so, so uh, you know, I, uh, what I want to uh, do is, is uh, um, I know you are working through it, and I know it's kind of, I'm placing this job on, 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 on your table to kind of derive this, uh, final scattering events, but uh, once you work through it, you get a number for the mobility based on the scattering rates as we have discussed earlier, and you get these numbers for mobility due to deformation potential, due to piezoelectric, due to polar optical phonons, if you work through it, you know, in the end, life is very simple because you have a nice formula here, you know, and you can plug it in and start looking at, can I explain, you know, all these numbers that you have. So these are just plots of these numbers now, you know. By changing deformation potential or temperature and all that, you can plot the whole thing here. And, you know, that, that thing is, is really, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to share with you a little uh, uh, simulation here. Uh, again, I'm not doing anything uh, more than just plotting these things, I had showed you already a few of these. And uh, for phonons, so here's a acoustic phonon deformation potential picture and some order of magnitudes at room temperature. We're looking at 10,000 sort of mobility for this particular situation with a effective mass of 0.2, for example. Uh, piezoelectric phonons, I'm not going to even pull that up. Optical phonon is very important, as I mentioned. Uh, and optical phonon scattering goes as the Bose-Einstein, you know, e to the power, uh, you know, phonon energy by kT here. And that's how it looks for a, I think I've plotted here for a few different semiconductors. Gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, strontium titanate, which is a perovskite. There's just different plots for different uh, semiconductors. And uh, you can have dislocation scattering, which we haven't covered here. You are not even necessary. And then you just combine all of them, and here's the plot you can generate. You know. And this is what you are doing as well, right, in this uh, assignment. Uh, so here's the phonon. Uh, uh, this is the optical phonon. Uh, here's some defect related. I can change the number of defects. Uh, for example, this is the point defect. So I can change it, and you can see if I increase the defect density, the mobility becomes, if, I, if I'm very high in defect density, the mobility is almost independent of temperature. And that's because it has become much stronger than phonon scattering. You know, so defect dominates now. Right? Uh, now, if I let it go, and uh, so there are basically various kinds of defects. I can have maybe dislocation, which is a Coulomb scattering. If I make it larger, your mobility may look like that. You know, instead of you know, improving with, Rather, reducing with temperature it may increase, but you are down in the dumps, very low already. You know, the start with. So it depends on all kinds of uh, defects and how they scatter, ionized impurities. You know, basically, you know, you can you can kind of. This is what you are doing in your assignment too, kind of plotting this whole thing, right? So, okay, I'll I'll stop here, uh, and and uh, you know, tomorrow I want to kind of carry over this phonon discussion, and we'll start talking about uh, superconductivity from here because. Uh, you know, this part requires a little bit of hard work in terms of evaluating these things, but the conceptually it's not very difficult. Superconductivity is conceptually a new thing in this course. So to me, you know, this is a uh, sort of a, uh, end of a part of the course, which is, uh, and the rest of the course now would be, uh, we're looking at uh, correlated effects or topological effects and such things from, from now on. I know I kind of hurried up a little bit in the end for the scattering part, but you know, we, 
if you have questions, I can discuss this in great detail. Uh, and I can also give you some more reading material. Okay, so this is the summary of diffusive or scattering related transport. Once you know how to deal with one scattering event, you can't handle all of them. The idea, the conceptually, it's not any different anymore. But uh, I want to, s superconductivity cannot be explained by Boltzmann transport. We want to now see how, how do you explain phenomena that go beyond <coughs> transport and scattering. 